I remember the first time I went to New Orleans in the distant way one remembers some near forgotten dream. I remember her like a ghost, like a shadow. I remember the feel of her in my body more than any particular image of her in my head. So I was 14 years old, and the occasion, ironically enough, was the biannual meeting of our conservative Pentecostal denomination. Even now, it's honestly hard to imagine the people who populated my childhood walking those dreamy, steamy streets. The air felt full of sex and salt water. Church of God preachers in their suits and ties and women in their long Sunday dresses walking down Bourbon Street on their way to worship at the Superdome. We Pentecostals historically are misfit people. We're products of the kind of sweaty spirituality that could only be given birth on the wrong side of the railroad tracks. But I definitely would not have known how to pair the bodily ecstatic worship of the Pentecostals with any of the kind of sensuous delight that was offered there in the French Quarter. The churches I grew up in, like New Orleans, had a penchant for colorful characters that seemed to walk out of a Flannery O'Connor short story. The fluid, free-flowing improvisation of jazz music, loud clothes, kind of a carnival atmosphere. But the sacred and secular were not really on speaking terms. They were as distant as Jerry Lee Lewis from his infamous cousin, the Reverend Jimmy Swaggart. I still have this memory of watching this pack of preachers that were in front of me walk past a stand that was selling novelty ties made to look like penises, which instinctively seems like it should read as pina. There was a store on the left where mannequins were decked out in an assortment of vinyl, leather, and lace. Walking past the seedy club across the street that's advertising seedy performances, I felt the sea in me stir. It was foreign. It was exciting. And frankly, it was terrifying. I had the distinct memory of cutting my eyes away quickly to the dirty concrete beneath my feet, scared to death by this strange city and by my own longing. I walked the French Quarter as a stranger, just a pilgrim passing through on my way to the Superdome, where the saints were marching in a little bit awkwardly, hopefully one day then on to heaven. I walked the street as I walked the world so much of my life, as a bystander, a spectator, not as a citizen of the parade. Looking back, I never really learned how to be at home in either world because I never learned how to be at home in my own skin. I longed for the ecstasy that was around me in the tent revival, every bit as much as I longed for the ecstasy around me in the French Quarter. But I lived too much in my head to get down to my soul and certainly into my body. I was stuck in my mind and on the surface of things. In both places, I was too afraid and too self-conscious to get lost in the music. I believed in all of the Pentecostal business. I wanted the jazz in me, the dance in me. I wanted the life in me. I wanted the life Jesus talked about when he said of a believer, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. God have mercy. I wanted the life that could only be lived from the belly. Then and now, I want to crackle. I want to howl. I want to rumble. I want to talk in tongues. 22 years later, I walk down Bourbon Street on a clear December morning. I taste the boozy, swampy smell in the back of my throat. The daylight settles in the French Quarter like a hangover. It feels less like today than it does the morning after. The city's coming awake, like a slow storm rising. There's a jazz man setting up on the sidewalk just ahead, and from a distance I hear a trombone playing outside the St. Louis Cathedral. A man in a suit smoking a slim cigarette approaches when I walk past the strip club. Come on in, he says. 
We got cold beer and warm nipples inside. I cut up St. Peter Street to get to the cathedral. Their folding table set up just outside, offering palm readings from voodoo spirit guides. As I step through the heavy doors, the smell of sex gives way to the smell of spirit, and I effortlessly slip into the wonder. I walk to the third row on the right, feeling my soul already finding sanctuary in the reverence. Kneeling, I begin to pray through my beads, taking slow, deep breaths between the psalm I'm meditating on. St. Louis Cathedral is in the middle of the carnival, the way God always is. Melting into the presence, awareness creeps through my very bones, and I know God is not only in this place, but in all the places I walk past to get here. God in the St. Charles streetcar I rode in on, and the old black man in the gold and black saint's toboggan cap sitting beside me. God in the white man with beady eyes and the polyester suit, summoning tourists into the cathedral with no windows, those who are on their own search for transcendence. God in the woman with the dreads reading tarot cards just outside the entrance to the church. God in the dazzling art that climbs all the way onto the roof of the cathedral. In the decadence and in the piety, love itself is sustaining us, making us exist. In him we live and move and have our being, the Apostle Paul wrote, assuring us that we're always in the presence of the one who is not far from each of us. In the breathing, my soul knows again that there is nowhere that God is not. Pressing softly into the divine, all the dualisms are dissolved. There is no us in them. There is no sacred and profane. There is the love that exists at the center of things and us like sheep who stumble into or out of the awareness of the one who calls us into existence. What better place to learn all of this than the city beneath the sea? New Orleans knows that sex and spirituality, voodoo and Catholicism, two sides of the same mystery. She knows that these little humans all want to get lost more than get found, to drift into a mystery larger than themselves. The young man who rings the bell at the brothel is unconsciously looking for God, Bruce Marshall wrote. She knows that the ordered world is an illusion, so the things we keep under the surface she puts out on the street. She knows that whatever cathedrals we wander into to pay homage, whether the gods on the wall are Jack Daniels or Jesus Christ, we're all looking to let go. We're all looking to lose ourselves into the night and into the wonder. Deep down, we all want to be all in. Somewhere. Anywhere as long as we're in over our heads. The first time I came to New Orleans, everything in my world was sharply divided. The dualisms of head and heart, body and spirit, light, dark, good guys, bad guys, all of that was already bone deep. My world was divided into us and them. That's the floor beneath us when we're walking above sea level. The world cannot change until we fall into the ocean or until the rain comes and floods us right where we are. New Orleans, as a saucer 20 feet below sea level, wears these secrets like a scar. She knows that in reality, a flood is always around the corner. We just didn't know it until we had one of our own. But the saints and sinners go marching in here without fear. She knows in her bones, after all, that there is life after the flood. The nightmare of Katrina had its way with the city of dreams. The levees broke. The waters were merciless. The losses were unfathomable. But she dances still because she knows the secret of death and resurrection. 
She knows that crisis brings all her misfits together. She knows that after the flood, you make new life and you make love the same way she's always made music, by trusting the people around you enough to improvise. She knows that there's life on the long side of dying. In the old New Orleans tradition, even a funeral is followed by a parade. The first line of participants is the friends and family escorting the casket. But the second line is comprised of the crowd and any passerby who wants to join the processional. See, she's not afraid of death because she knows that even dying is an invitation to a deeper, more authentic way of living, an invitation to join the parade. When I came back to New Orleans, I came back after my own flood. The life that had felt so safe, so comfortable, the life that was so familiar, all of that was under the sea, and everything I once loved was now underwater. I'd lost heart, lost hope. I'd lost myself in the depths. In other words, I was finally ready to understand the city beneath the sea. It's no wonder then that sitting in that open air cafe, watching the people outside St. Louis Cathedral, there was no more us in them. I could be kin with the Asian tourist and the grizzly bearded palm reader and the children on the field trip, happier with each other than impressed by the austere beauty of the cathedral. I felt like I belonged on New Orleans Island of drunken misfit toys. Instead of judging her, I came longing for this city of second chances to make room for me around her table too. Nobody's past is counted against them here. New Orleans doesn't just smell like sex and salt water to me anymore. She smells like the gospel.